So when we got close enough to the beach and the machine guns opened fire on us, the bullets were bouncing off the ramp because it was metal, it was up. But I knew eventually I had to drop the ramp and then the bullets, instead of hitting the ramp, they would come into the boat. It was brutal. The beach was just horrible. The smell, the stench was brutal. I was burning tanks, everything. And I saw this kid with a radio on his back, and I said, ha-ha, there's my savior. And I started to walk down towards him, and uh, uh, there was an overhead burst took place. It hit him, and it cut his arm off, and it destroyed the damn radio. To the back of me, there was a soldier. So, so I hollered, hey, buddy, you, have you got a match? No answer. I turned and looked, and there was no head under the helmet. My job originally, I was a gunner's mate. I was in charge of four 20 millimeter anti aircraft guns on the stern of the ship. But during invasions, I was on the Higgins boat going into the beach. At uh, four o'clock in the morning, we started dropping our boats in the water. We had 26 Higgins boats. You know what a Higgins boat is, right? Yeah. We had 26 boats. We circled the ship one time, supposed to be good luck, and we headed towards the, uh, the beaches. We were 11 miles out because the Germans had a gun called the 88, which is the best gun in the war, and had a range of 10 miles. So all the transports were 11 miles out, which is very good for them. Not for us, because it took us two hours to get to the beach. And in the water, going to the beach, were mines made out of glass or plastic. And you could hardly see them in the water, you know. A couple of boats, not for my ship, but a couple of boats hit the mines and they got killed. Yeah. We couldn't get on the beach. You know, a Higgins boat was on the beach. We couldn't get on the beach because there was obstacles in the water. You know, these coarse beams with metal. And it was mine. And along the beach, the Germans had 33 machine guns. M M42s, it, it fires 160 rounds per minute. So my job originally, I'm a gunner's mate. So I was supposed to be posting a machine gun on the boat. You in the service? You know how they act? You know what they do? About three or four weeks before the invasion, they took my gun away. If you ask me why, I don't know. So consequently, instead of the machine guns, they give me the job of dropping the ramp. You know, in the front of the boat. The boat is made out of wood. But in the front of the boat, they have this ramp, like a garage door ramp. And it's made of two or three inch metal. So it could withstand, withstand either a rifle or a machine gun. So when we got close enough to the beach, we only go about 200 yards from the beach. That's, that's the closest we could get. And the machine guns opened fire on us. And uh, the bullets were bouncing off the ramp because it was metal, it was up. But I knew eventually I had to drop the ramp, and then the bullets, instead of hitting the ramp, they would come into the boat. So the coxswain says to me, drop the ramp. I never heard him, because the roar of the cannons, two big diesel engines in the back of the boat, I never heard him. Then the second time he says to me, drop the ramp. And I froze for a few seconds, because I didn't want to die. And I knew once I dropped that ramp, the bullets, and then he said to me, he says, God damn, DeVita dropped the effing ramp. So I had no choice. I dropped the ramp. The machine guns opened up fire. Killed about 14, 15 troops that were in the front of the boat. Now, my, where I was, there was a crank that lowered and raised the ramp. I was about three quarters of the way back. You know anything about uh, basketball? You know, pickers? Yes. Well, I had soldiers in front of me. They were my pick. They were absorbing the bullets that would come to me, you know. 
But I had two stragglers. They didn't want to die, so they didn't want to get the other troops to go forward. They stayed with me. They thought by staying with me, they'd be safe. Unfortunately, by staying with me, they were drawn fire from the hills. They didn't help me. There was two guys. One guy was about four feet away from me. The other guy was about two feet away from me. The first guy got hit, ripped his stomach open. His stomach's outside his belly. Fortunately, he lived. This guy lived. And the other guy that was two feet away from me, he was a red-headed kid. The machine gun took his helmet off and part of his, his brain, a part of it. And he was crying, help me, help me, help me. I had no morphine, I couldn't help him. So he fell at my feet. Excuse me if I get an emotion. He, he fell at my feet and he was crying, help me, help me, help me. I had nothing in my kit to help him. So the only thing I had was the Lord's Prayer. And I started praying, Our Father, who art in heaven. I, I never finished it. Then he slumped down. I knew he, I knew he was going to die. And I reached down and I squeezed his hand. I want him to know that he wasn't alone. And he died. He died. He was just a little boy, just a little boy. So the, the coxswain says, pick up the ramp because we're getting a lot of flack from the hills and from the machine guns on the beach. So he says to me, raise the ramp. So I pulled the handle, the ramp would not go up. Pulled it a second time, the ramp would not go up. So I put it on auto, wouldn't go up. So my job, there was probably maybe 15 guys still alive on that boat. My job was to protect these guys with, with, with the ramp. So I, I couldn't see the ramp from where I was because of all the dead bodies in front of me. So I had to do something I didn't want to do. I was crawling over the dead bodies and asking my, for, my, for them to forgive us. They were dead. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I climbed over the dead bodies and I started going through the ramp. And all of a sudden, one guy came out. I don't know if he was a crew member or army. I didn't care, so I had some help. So when we got to the, close enough to the beach, I wanted to know why the ramp wouldn't go up. There was two dead soldiers. They never got out of the boat. And they were on the ramp. It plus the weight of the soldiers. And each soldier had 90 pounds on his backpack. So the ramp would not go up. So, this other guy and myself, I pointed to his belt and we grabbed his belt and by step by step by step, we pulled him into the, the two boys that were dead, into the boat. Then he says to me, raise the ramp. So without the two guys, when I had it on a pilot, it came up by itself anyhow. So. You know, the Germans are very diabolical. They know how to kill people. Besides the mines and the machine guns, they're telephone poles. On top of the telephone pole was a mine. It wasn't screwed in or nailed in. It was just sitting there. So if you happen to tap the telephone pole, that mine would come in your boat. We were scared of the telephone poles. So anyhow, the, co the coxswain was with me. 
He was a little kid from uh, Brooklyn, New York, Dermot. And uh, he got out of it, because don't forget, he had, he had to go backwards through these mines, through these telephone poles. He turned the boat around, and we started heading towards my boat. My captain was very smart, which he, each wave, he came a little close to the shore, a little close to the shore. So we headed for my boat, my ship rather, and then we saw this white ship with a big red cross on it. It's a hospital ship. So instead of going to our ship, we went to the hospital ship. Because we had a lot of wounded aboard, badly wounded. And when we got to the hospital ship, there was a ramp on the back. And two guys from the hospital ship, God bless them, they jumped into my boat. And they did something we couldn't do. They were peeling the dead off to get to the wounded. I, I don't remember exactly. I was like in a little shock at that time. I don't remember if they got five, six, I don't know how many. But they got these guys and they put them in a the hospital ship. At least they were going to live. That, you know, they, they had wheelchairs. They, they had morphine, they had everything on the hospital ship. I, I was happy that these guys are going to get all the care they needed. So then these two guys jumped out of the boat. We pulled it away from the hospital ship and we headed towards my ship. On the back of my ship, they had dropped a sled. A sled is like a garage door, a big garage door. And we would put the dead and wounded on there and then the crank would take them aboard ship. So somebody yelled through a klaxon horn, I want one man from each boat to come up to be interviewed, or not interviewed, because he figured maybe we could help the next wave. So I got aboard the sled and I went up and there. Yeah. And I was interviewed by a, a Navy, Navy guy and a big Army guy. That guy had hands as big as a baseball mitt. And he did something, like I said, I was just shocked. He did something, he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, it's all right, it's all right, son. It was like a hug, like a hug. So I was interviewed with him. Then this army guy said to me, he says, son, let me teach you something. He said, those machine guns can only fire for so long. Then they burn, they get hot. And they got to change, change the barrels. When they change the barrels, that's when you drop the ramp. So I said, how much time do I have? Two to three seconds to change the barrel. So that's what I did. So then after I was interviewed, See, my boat already had pulled away to 28. So I'm waiting for another boat. And I'm standing on deck. And nobody's around me because I stunk to high heaven. My uniform was covered with blood and puke. So I'm standing by myself. And I said to myself, do I want to go back? into the belly of the beast and face those machine guns. I didn't want to die. So I thought about it for a while. And I said to myself, if I don't go, they're going to send a replacement. Suppose a replacement gets killed. How could I live with myself? So I made up my mind. I'm going back. And I went back 14 more times. I made 15 trips all together. The Germans owned the beach. The Germans owned the beach, not us. And they were slaughtering the troops left and right from the hills and from the ground. From the ground. These, these poor guys, they had no chance. You know, it was flat like a, like a pool table. 
no place to hide. You can't dig in sand. By the fifth wave, we ran out of troops. So we started taking the 29th Division because the 29th Division was on Utah, and Utah at that time was clean. So they swung over to help the 1st Division. And that's the first five. We ran out of troops, and we had to do something else. Instead of going into the beach, we started to take the dead and the wounded off the beach. We had to get in the water. I weighed 125 pounds. I couldn't lift one of these guys up. So two or three of us we got. And we put them in the boat. We started going back to my ship. Now, I don't know how many wounded we took to my ship, but I do know that we took 308 dead bodies. Why do I know that? Because I had a good friend of mine, John Ola, who was a quartermaster, and his job was to put the bodies in the body bags, and he dispensed 308 dead body bags. So, so now they brought my boat up. I don't remember what boat it was because the 28 was gone. They brought my boat up, and I looked at that boat. It looked like Swiss cheese. The machines had decimated it. And I'm saying to myself, how, how the hell did anybody live off that boat, right? So I, I got aboard ship. I, I bought the ship, yeah. And I'm, I, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And the captain was so good for it. That he, his name was Captain Fritsch. He understood what we had gone through. So after we took these 300 dead bodies and the, the wounded, I don't know how many wounded we were, we started going back to Southampton. That was the home base. And we went to Southampton. I want to backtrack a little bit. When I'm aboard the ship and we're going towards Southampton, I'm all by myself. They announced over the loudspeaker, there's cheese sandwiches and coffee for the crews that went into the beach. So everybody went down to the mess hall. I didn't want to go. First of all, I stunk to heaven, high heaven. And I didn't want him to see my cry. I didn't want him to see cry. So I walked back to my 20 millimeter guns and I sat down and I'm reflecting. And I said to myself, what the hell just happened? And how come I'm still alive? How come I'm still alive? So it was a wet deck. It was probably 10, 11 o'clock. I forget the time. And I'm all alone. And I looked around to see if any of my mates were with me. Nobody was there. But when I turned around, all the dead bodies, the 308 bed dead bodies, like a quart of wood, I started to cry. And I cried myself to sleep. And the next morning when we pulled into Southampton, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I think it was Lieutenant Gruber, I'm not sure. He said, the, the V to get up, we have to unload the dead and the, then the wounded. And really, that's the end of my story. That's the end of my story. So my cousin Chick and I were walking around on a Saturday m morning and uh, walked by the Roxy Theater and it, it said, uh, Saturday matinee, Gene Autry, America's favorite cowboy, 10 cents. Between us, we couldn't come up with a penny. He says, Jake, the National Guard, is advertising they want to fill their ranks. This is when Hitler took the, the Sudetenland from 
Czechoslovakia, and annexed Austria. So the National Guard was preparing itself for a war in 1938. And uh, he said, Chick says, let's go down to the armory and, and enlist. I says, sure, we're, we're 15 years old. You have to be 18 years old. Chick said to me, Jake, we'll go down there. And when they ask you how old you are, you look them right in the eye and, and say, 18 years, sir. He, he looked up, what can I do for you young men? Well, that, that was a, in, give us inspiration right there, being called young men when we were just 15-year-old boys. I said, sir, we'd like to join the National Guard. And I'm looking at him and thinking, 18, 18, 18. He said, what year were you born? Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was born in 1922. Take three away from, from that, that's 1919. 1919, sir. He says, sign right here. Then the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor. And the next thing I knew, the 135th Infantry Regiment was moved to Fort Dix, New Jersey for embarkation. So we went overseas and uh, started off out in, in Armagh, North, North Ireland, got transferred into G3 of Fifth Corps. I didn't even know what G3 was at that time. And Fifth Corps, what in the world is that, man? I'm a, from an infantry. I found out. <laughs> Corps. There's two corps under every army. And a corps has two divisions on it, in it. Man, I'm, I'm a, from an infantry regiment. You can't get any lower. And here I am up, up next to army. And G3, there's four Gs in the corps. G1 is personnel. G2, intelligence. Where they go out and get intelligence on the enemy and they inform. G3, the plans and training. Plans. I became a, a, a sergeant. And out of the 30 people, Colonel Hill picked me to go with him to plan the invasion. We, we, we went to uh, Portsmouth, and that's where General Eisenhower and uh, all his staff was down there. I, I didn't see him. We worked on the, the troop movements of, of our two divisions under us. We had, we had the first division and the 29th Division under us that landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day. That's uh, pretty, pretty much how I got in on the invasion. On D-Day, I, I landed w w with uh, troops from the 1st Division, the 16th Infantry Regiment, and uh, when we when we got to uh, the shore, we we landed with water right up to our chins. They, they left us off too far out, and uh, I had been the first one on on that LST, so I sat right next to the pilot, a, a Navy pilot, and. Uh, when the, the ramp went down 
and they got into the water and out. I was the last one in line. Now, I'll tell you that they, they had over a million mines in that Omaha Beach, a, a million. And th there were other lines going in at the same time that we were going in. And once in a while, the spurt of water would sh shoot up in the air. Somebody stepped on a mine. I was more afraid of stepping on a mine than I was at the gunfire coming at us. And, and when, when we got up out of, the, out of the water, I separated from the 16th Regiment. And I got behind a berm. I drawn machine gun fire from two, two machine guns. These German machine guns. Just machine guns. Four, 42 shot, 1,200 rounds a minute, twice as fast as any of ours. So they, they had me pinned down from, from both sides of, of the cliffs, and I got behind this little berm that was six, eight inches tall, and that, that berm saved my life there. And while they were shooting right there in front of that berm, I, I dragged out a cigar, cigarette. I had a waterproof cigarette holder. P put it in my mouth, my matches were wet. I, 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 I could see per, peripheral vision. To the back of me, there was a soldier. So, so I hollered, hey, buddy, you, have you got a match? No answer. I turned and looked, and there was no head under the helmet. It probably saved my life to turn. It's like the soul of that guy said, get up and get out of here now. And by some miracle, those machine guns stopped to reload or to change barrels or something. I got up and ran toward the cliffs. And while I was running, they got started again, and they were firing at me, and I said, God, what is happening? I'm getting fired at, I can't, I can't see anybody to shoot back at. I made it to the cliff without a scratch. At that time, they opened up the path up the cliff through this ravine that had been filled with barbed wire, couldn't get up there, and they had Bangalore torpedoes came in, and they shoved those up there and blasted out that barbed wire. And that's when the Germans cleared out, because once you get behind them, you, you, you got them dead to rights. So uh, I, to tell you the truth, I do not remember going up that cliff, or up that ravine, and everything. The, the, the next thing I remember, Madison Rich, Corporal Madison Rich and I were digging our, our foxholes. It, it was seven o'clock at night uh, on D-Day. I had found a, a litter, brand new. It was just laying there. So I dug my foxhole a little bit longer and put that litter in the bottom. I was going to sleep on that and avoid the wet sand. And 
7.15 at night, someone said for, hollered from the command post, Sergeant Larson, Colonel Hill wants to see you immediately. So I went in, reported to Colonel Hill, and he says, Sergeant, he says, I, I just got word from First Army. They want me to keep G3 open 24 hours a day. You are going to run the night shift. I said, starting right now? He said, starting right now. So I, I, I went back. And, uh, it still wasn't 7.30, so I went back and told Madison Rich. I said, hey, Maddie, you, you can sleep in my foxhole tonight. I got that litter in there. And he says, Jake, I got my fart sack already here. So he laid his M1 Garand rifle on my litter, and he went to sleep. I went to work. And at midnight, a German reconnaissance plane came, came over, and started taking p pictures. They had these parachute, uh, uh, handkerchief size parachutes with magnesium flares in there that lighten up the sky like better than daylight. And our anti aircraft then started shooting up at them. And uh, after a while, that, that didn't, uh, and I don't remember a thing until somebody came to relieve me at 7.30 in the morning. At 7.30, they said, you're off, Jake. So I went, went to my foxhole, and here Madison Rich was getting up from his, and he reached down and picked up his rifle off of my litter, and it broke in two. A piece of shrapnel from our gun shooting at that reconnaissance plane, a piece of our shrapnel came down and hit that rifle and broke that rifle in two. There is a God. There is a God. I can recall almost every moment from the time I left Weymouth, England, on the ship, the uh, Empire Javelin, to the time I got off the beach, to the time I crawled up the hill to get into Viaville. I remember every single moment of it. One of the things that happened uh, while I was on the deck of the Javelin, the chap in front of me was scheduled to go on before I was. I was scheduled to go on another LCA, but uh, on the way down on the side of the ship, uh, as the we were we were in probably four to five foot swells coming on the side of the ship, so the LCA was going up and down. And uh, you know, what you do, what you had to do, is figure when you were going to drop into the ship so that you met it coming up and going down. And what happened? The kid in front of me uh, misjudged his fall and he fell down and broke his leg. And they had to put a rope on and haul him back up again. And I was next in line to go on. So we were a few minutes behind schedule, and I went down on the side of a, the, the ladder going down and uh, got into the LCA, and I sat on the starboard side, the right-hand front part of the landing craft assault. Now, you understand a landing craft assault is a different animal than the LCVP, and very low uh, water line uh, um, on the sides, so you got wet fast. I came in on the third wave. We left about 25 minutes after the initial assault group went, which was A Company and B Company. We uh, started to circle, first of all, and then the LCA, LCM that was there, they gave us a signal to uh, roll out and go laterally into the, into the shoreline. We were about 10 miles off the beach, and my concern was, my God, you'd think they'd hear us, but we weren't making so much noise. But on the other hand, 10 miles out, you don't hear anything. So we went in. Uh, on the way in, uh, the uh, C-47s were coming back across from Cotonin Peninsula. And the Texas and a couple of the other battleships started their gunfire. 
And the big thing was the uh, excitement of seeing the uh, rocket ships throw the stuff in. We figured, gee whiz, this, this should be a piece of cake going in. And it kind of uh, removed the fear that we had going in because we figured, gee, this is going to be easy. It's not going to be as hot as we thought it was going to be. We got in about uh, maybe two or three miles off the shore, and uh, one of the other LCAs next to us swamped completely and went down. And the LCM that was following us picked them up and got them in. We continued on. It was bigger than mine. I was heading for one beach, the Easy Green Beach, but instead, uh, because when we got off to shore off the Easy Green Beach, we could see that it was being clobbered. So uh, the coxswain, which is a British coxswain, who I later met about 15 years later, or 20 years later, uh, told me what happened. He said, we just ran out of space. We didn't have any place to put us. So they moved over and went from Dog, from Easy Green over to Dog Red Beach. And that's where I came in at Dog Red. And um, as we were coming in, um, we, struck a, uh, we struck another ship that had sunk, or another LCA that had sunk. We scraped the bottom, and we also hit a sandbar. And at the same time, uh, the water was up to our waist. I got rid of my combat vest, got rid of everything except my helmet, which I have out in the car right now with me. And I carry it with me no matter where I go. And uh, uh, as we came in, um, we swamped. We went off on, uh, we went off to port, and uh, the boat rolled over, and we all went in the water. Fortunately, I got rid of my vest, got rid of all the stuff that I had with me. All I have on is my helmet, which I tied on tight. I got rid of the combat jacket, my rifle, everything, and into the water, and uh, saw that a lot of the guys had gone in with too much weight on them, and the next thing I know, there's his feet appearing. And I grabbed one kid that was next to me that had already come up, gone down and come back up again. And I grabbed him and used him as a shield. This bothered me more than anything else. It really bothered me for the longest time. It was only a recent, maybe 20 years ago, that I was able to deal with that and talk about it. But uh, I used him as a body, like a body shield. And we swam into the beach, and uh, uh, I pushed him as far as I could. We were probably in about 10 or 15 feet of water. And uh, I swam the best I could. And uh, it was, the water was bloody and oily. And I got there and uh, got him. And I could feel my feet touch the ground. And I pulled him and got up on it and got my knees on the ground. And the surf was coming in because the flood had already begun. So it was probably... Uh, maybe 10 feet beyond where the low tide was at that particular point, which was good because it brought me closer to where there was a, a steel, uh, the German had put the uh, barriers up, and I wanted to get near one of those barriers, which I did. Uh, I got as close to the barrier as I could possibly get, and uh, uh, I got in there, and uh, the machine guns were coming at us. There was a few mortar shells, but very few, mostly machine gun fire coming. And uh, one of the things that happened, and this is where it becomes very emotional for me, uh, I reached a point where I could see that I had to talk to God in a real hurry. And uh, I remember looking up to God, and I yelled, God, no matter what it is you want me to do, I'll do it forever or the rest of my life. And almost instantly, uh, the Navy had shut down uh, smoke flares way down below the beach near Vierville. And the smoke had drifted up by us. At that point, uh, Colonel Cannon, who was my regimental commander, had come along in the smoke and said, okay, guys, get off the beach, get your ass up here, get up to the beach and, and run. And it was almost simultaneously. And he yelled, 29, let's go. And we did. We get up to the burn, and we made it to the burn. And... Uh, uh, Managed to get up there, soaking wet. So, I mean, we're talking about a beach that's like a quarter of a mile long to get up. And how I managed to get there, I don't know, but God was helping me. And uh, we stayed there for about maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And then there was a staff sergeant that was with me who was regiment. He was uh, a non-com um, and from the regimental command, INR section. And I didn't realize that I was with a whole bunch of INR guys. I didn't know because I lost track of who I was with. 
And what we did is we had one mission, and that was to get into Viaville and get up into the town. And we crawled along for almost three quarters of an hour to maybe an hour, all along the beach on our hands and knees, in the old using the arms in this routine, and got into the area where uh, there was a concrete barrier. And we figured, oh, we'll never get around this. But that was later on. Uh, a guy by the name of Noel Doobie blew that out, and that ended that problem. But in the meantime, uh, we were able to get up into Viaville through the barbed wire, and it was at this point I saw a ranger coming down with a couple of jerrys. We couldn't get over it. My God, we figured, hey, maybe this thing is over. We don't know it. <laughs> and uh, he brought the jerrys down. I can remember looking at them, and they seemed to be either, you know, Japanese or Mongolians or something, but they weren't, they weren't you know, blue-eyed, blonde Germans. So we figured maybe something's different. Maybe we're in the wrong beach. I don't know, but in any event, we managed to crawl up the beach into Viaville and uh, uh, crawl up so-called the D1 draw, which is the Viaville draw, and uh, up into uh, Viaville. And at the top of Viaville, we started getting some machine gun fire. And uh, there was a couple of guys with us uh, that uh, said, you know, just stay cool, don't, don't get up, don't do it. Now, we have no rifles, we have no nothing, okay? I can recall stopping long enough to open up a uh, K ration and found a chocolate bar and some cheese crackers in there and I ate that. That was the first time I had eaten since I left the bloody ship. And finally uh, got up into, uh, into Viaville and we realized that we had to get across the road at the top of the road and go to the right and get over to the farmhouse that was near us. As we moved over to the farmhouse, the idea is to get in back and over by the church. Now the church is the mission. That's where we were scheduled to go. Now, the top of the church has been blown off at this particular point. The, the, the Navy did a beautiful job in taking care of that situation, so we didn't have to concern ourselves. That was our, what was originally going to be our mission. Got into the, uh, into the uh, little village, and uh, I can remember uh, a little Frenchman, and uh, one of the guys that was with us uh, yelled at him and he could speak French, and he said, are there Jerry's back there? And he said, no. And he led us around and back, and down into the into the uh, into the uh, area between two walls, and uh, we got in there and crawled along and got to where the church was. At this particular point, we started to take a lot of fire. We couldn't imagine where it was coming from, and then we realized this is American fire coming at us from the Navy. And uh, the sergeant that was with me said to me. Uh, does anybody anybody have radio experience? And I says, yes, I do. He says, well, get your butt down there and go back to the beach and get a radio. we got to stop this or we'll get clobbered. And uh, so I did swing back. on. I saw the little Frenchman. He gave me the thumbs up, and he says, you're all go. And smiled, and I can remember his bed. He had a cigarette in his mouth, and I can remember the whole thing as though it was yesterday. Down onto the road, down onto the beach, I'm saying, son of a gun, I just came from this place. And it was brutal. The beach was just horrible. The smell, the stench was brutal. I was burning tanks, everything. Now, bear in mind, the tanks had never got, these tanks had never got their, the way they went down in the water because they had the rubber things around them and they never made it. I think maybe one tank did, but there was nothing they could do. You couldn't move because the, the Jersey barrier was there right at the Vareville draw, so that had to be taken care of. Uh, I never got to see Coda, but I knew he was down there. You always tell Coda because he had a cigar in his mouth. He didn't smoke it, but he just chewed on it. And uh, I went over to the right side, and I watched, waiting for to see if there was somebody with a radio coming up. There was an LCI came came ashore, and they started to take a lot of fire initially, and then it stopped. And I saw this kid with a radio on his back, and I said, ha-ha, there's my savior. And I started to walk down towards him, probably maybe, maybe 25 or 30 yards, he was coming up at me. We, we were probably separated by maybe 40 yards of land. And uh, uh, there was an overhead burst took place. It hit him, and it cut his arm off, and it destroyed the damn radio. And I went down to him, and a medic was with me, and we tried to pull him up, but his arm had been severed completely, and the kid died. And it's still right now. I see this kid. This was the first one I'd ever seen ever getting killed. Um, I don't know who he was from. I never knew what his name was or anything. But the medic and myself pulled him up. As we started to pull him up, another shell burst, and I caught mine in my left leg. And they, the medic also got hit in his arm. 
but we still managed to pull them up to the berm, and we hid under the berm. And that's where I spent the night, in the berm, okay? And that was it. That was my D-Day. There wasn't enough time to sleep. And so I uh, just went over my equipment, made sure I had everything, made sure everything was working, and suddenly we heard, attention U.S. Rangers, attention U.S. Rangers. I'm trying to get the exact words, but it meant man the boats. And so we went up on the deck and all of our assault boats, being British, were hoisted by davits up to the loading decks. So we just climbed into the boat while it was there on the, on the deck. And they lowered us with the davits uh, into the waters. Now, we did crash into the side of the boat and things like that, and the tackle got jammed. And fortunately, the British had the necessary tools and ax, and they cut enough of the lowering ropes that we were lowered into the water. Uh, really without incident. We then proceeded on our mission, which was to go to La Pointe d'Auc and uh, land there after the second ranger battalion. They had three companies assaulting those cliffs. And after they had successfully reached the top, they were to send a message to us. And then we would go in with six, co actually eight companies of rangers and we would exploit the point to hawk capture and then go out and set up blocking positions so the Germans could not get any infantry in to support the uh, German defenses of the beaches. Uh, the second battalion never showed up. They were sent to the wrong point by uh, their guide boat, and uh, as a result, they were a half hour late. But we had to leave at the end of half an hour. We weren't allowed to wait over in case they were late. So we, we had left. They did land. First man up the, up the cliffs was up in something like 51 seconds. Uh, he cheated. There was a bomb crater on the edge of the cliffs and sort of a hemisphere of bomb crater there. There was debris that fell out on the bottom, maybe 30 feet of it. So he ran up the 30 feet of debris. He was a marvelous athlete. He climbed up some 30 feet and was in the bottom of a bomb crater, had a rope with him, threw the rope out, and all of a sudden he was building up members of his squad, that type thing. Uh, other people had more difficult times using rope ladders, using uh, metal ladders, using toggle rope climbs and all sorts of things like that. But the, the second battalion got up on top of the cliffs and uh, radioed their message, we're there, but we were already practically at Vierville we uh, passed landing control, which are boats about a thousand yards offshore that <clears throat> tell you any events you need to know about. And they said, do not attempt to land at Vierville. The casualties are 95%. Half of them killed. Land on Dog White Beach. So we shifted over to Dog White Beach and uh, we landed our first wave there, two companies of the 2nd Battalion plus a headquarters boat, and they were cut like everybody else on Omaha Beach. They were cut down to about 50%. All the officers killed or wounded. And uh, my battalion commander was watching a thousand yards out. The, the waves were about a thousand yards. And he said, they quote, I'm not going to lose my battalion on that beach. So he talked the British flotilla commander into going farther east. And the commander was not at all averse to it. He did coordinate with the higher people up, and they all agreed. So we moved a mile more, and uh, suddenly we found a beach with breakwaters. Well, the breakwaters come 
up to the seawall. They're the same height as the seawall, about four or five feet. But the, they formed little barriers, made us like we were in forts on three sides and water on the other. And as a result, when we went in there, we took five casualties. Other people were taking 50% casualties. So we got our whole battalion landing intact, which by the way is the name of my book. <laughs> but uh, in any event, we landed and we took very few casualties on the beach, but only because of the breakwaters. Now, above us, who should be shooting at us, the hills were afire, and I mean active grass fires. So the Germans couldn't see us through the flames and smoke, and they couldn't shoot at us. There was a nose on the hill to our left, and nobody down there from the left could shoot at us because all they saw when they looked to the where we should have been, all they could see was water. Um, the only place we were getting shot at was from down the beach to our right, and it was 30 or 40 machine guns, plus probably two, 300 infantrymen, plus mortars and things like that, which was enough. The artillery that everybody feared was located at Vierville, and the artillery was shooting at the boats and the ships as they came in. So when, once you got off the boats and on the beach, all you had to contend with was small arms fire. Well, we had these breakwaters in between us and the small arms fire. So we, we got off the beach within 15, 20 minutes and uh, went up the bluffs and uh, the Germans at least half of them, because of the flames of the grass fire, at least half of them had deserted their positions and left their explosives there in the foxholes. And uh, so we got up the hills with relatively little resistance. When I say relatively, I mean relatively, because there were some people killed on the way up. But uh, nothing like people were losing on the beach who weren't protected by these uh, sea walls and uh, breakwaters actually. So we got up there into the uh, Bocage and uh, we were very lucky there again. Harvest had not taken place so the fields were filled with mostly grassy crops that were three to six feet tall and if you got caught by a machine gun or by ambush in there. All you had to do was to drop down. They couldn't see you. They had no idea where you were. They knew what the range was. You just rolled over a few times and then crawled to the nearest hedgerow, maybe went over, came in behind the resistance. And we had very little problems initially with hedgerows. Later when they got vehicles up, uh, the tanks could not penetrate the hedgerows, and uh, they, tanks will not venture forward without infantry. So uh, they had a lot of problems later with the hedgerows, but it was mostly the tanks and the vehicles that had the problems. But the early on infantry, those grasses were just worth their weight in gold because they could not see you. And unaimed rifle fire doesn't hit anything. So it was good. Let me follow up on a couple of the things. Yeah. Uh, was when, when you found out as you approached uh, a thousand yards out from the beach, yeah. was, that, was that your first indication about just how intense the casualties were at different parts along the beach? We didn't know until we hit that first landing control, that it was murder on the beach, and it was. And A Company of the 116th Infantry from the Blue and Gray Division, the 29th, uh, they did suffer 98% casualties, of whom half were killed and half were, were just wounded. Only eight men in an entire infantry company escaped unwounded. And those eight men do not a company make, believe me. So uh, we learned the conditions there. Uh, when we 
made our landing at the boundary between dog green and dog white. Uh, there were two companies of the 2nd Battalion. One company, B Company, landed on Dog White, and A Company landed on, well, I have them backwards. B Company landed on Dog Green, the edge of it, and the other company landed on Dog White. So uh, they had different results. The uh, company that landed on Dog Green lost their boat. One of the boats was sunk about 200 yards out. So they stra straggled through the surf to get ashore, all the time exposed to machine guns on the ridge. The other platoon uh, managed to escape all that and came through in pretty good shape. The two companies and the headquarters boat landed on uh, Dog White, and they were met immediately with 50% casualties, of whom 10% at least were killed. So they had a rough time, and that's when we diverted one mile, and it's almost to the inch, <laughs> one mile to find the uh, breakwaters, and uh, we came in on the breakwaters. Now, you were blessed in a couple of ways. You got rerouted to a less oh, yes. intense spot. You mentioned the smoke on the, on the bluff. Also, as, as you've said, um, you, know, you came in about 7.50 a.m., I believe you said? 7.50. I, my foot hit the water at 7.50. And at that point, the difference between the tides then and when the first wave had gone in was quite different, correct? Absolutely. Uh, there were, there was approximately 50 yards of beach when I landed. Uh, when the original troops had landed, there were 250 yards of beach. And they had to walk that beach through the obstacles with the artillery and uh, small arms fire, dogging them all the way. And frankly, there weren't very, very few heroes in those early units that landed. They, they, they just got chewed up badly. And when they got to the beach, the bomb craters weren't there. The Air Force didn't release their bombs until a, a mile later. And it was a mess. And uh, the 1st Division and the 29th Division both took it on the chin. Terrible losses. One of the challenges for you is to cut through the wire yeah. Uh, how did you, what weapons did you use to Well, do that? the wire was on the far side of the coastal road. And when I say coastal road, it was nothing but beach bungalows. It was macadamized, but it wasn't wide enough for vehicles to pass each other without running off the macadamized road. Um, on the other side of that road, there was the equivalent of a double apron fence barbed wire fence. And uh, it was not only double apron, but it was two double aprons, one double apron fence and then another, about 30 feet of barbed wire. Uh, what we did was we inserted Bangalore torpedoes, which are about six feet long, but you can screw them together, so now you've got 12 feet, you can screw them together, now you've got 18 feet, and so on. So when the grenadiers went forward, they had already gotten themselves about 20 feet. And uh, with help, they passed, the pe people on the beach helped move the Bangalores forward, and then the Bangalore torpedo men themselves took the last Bangalore torpedo, ran it across the road under the wire. Having gotten it to the wire, they pulled the fuse lighters, which gave them three seconds, and they took three seconds to run back across the road. And in the process, we didn't lose a single torpedo man. In the, the hole that I went through, there were two Bangalore torpedo men who went in 10 feet apart, and they really blew us a big hole. Uh, it was like a 20-foot hole to go through. But there were little strands of wire still there 
under your feet and some of them had loops and your feet caught in them. You had to be very careful uh, going through the blown area. But you got through, nobody got, became casualties or anything like that because it was almost impossible for anything on the bluffs down here to shoot at the foot of the bluffs here. And the bluffs were close to 100 yards from the beach, so I mean, it was impossible. So we got through pretty easily and uh, started up the bluffs, and we took a lot of casualties in the hedgerows and things like that. And you mentioned the seawall earlier uh, and how, you know, you're really on the beach about 15 or 20 minutes yeah. before you made your way up the bluff, but you had an interesting encounter uh, while you were still on the beach with an old friend. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, he wasn't my old friend, but I knew his kids from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, he was Brigadier General Coda. Uh, he was a Daniel Coda too, but everybody called him Dutch. And Dutch Coda, well, we were sitting there in our little fort waiting for orders from battalion. Sullivan, the deputy, said, you stay here and uh, I'll go down and get the orders. So he went down and got the orders, and he was back in two or three minutes. But uh, during that time, my rangers were very curious men. They couldn't look at anything without wondering what it is, what does it do? And they said, hey, Cap. And I said, what do you want? They said, who's that guy down there on the beach? And I looked down the beach, and here was a little old fat man. He was just at the very far edge of the beach, I mean, where the dunes began. And uh, I said, I don't know. Uh, he's either a crazy reporter who doesn't know what he's doing, or he's a high-ranking officer who does know what he's doing. Because he was gesticulating to the troops and waving at them and shaking his fist. He had a cigar in his mouth, which occasionally, it was not lit, which occasionally he would wave and things like that. And as he moved, the 29th Division troops who were caught on the beach moved up to the dunes and on the dunes and started up the plateau and up the bluffs finally. And, uh, it took him about two minutes and he finally got to my position. He went down to the end of the uh, retard, the breakwater, and I said, I better get down there and find out which do I follow. Plan A, tackle him and turn him over to the medics, or plan B, salute him and report. Well, he came around the end of the uh, breakwaters and I looked and there was a little tiny silver star on his collar. And I said, whoops, plan B. So I went up to him and people criticized me for it. I did a snappy hand salute, which he returned. And I said, sir, Captain Ron, 5th Ranger Infantry Battalion, uh, we've just landed on this beach. Actually, I told him those where the situation a little bit later. And he looked at me, he said, Ron? And I said, yes, General Ron. And he said, uh, you're not Jack Ron's son, are you? And I said, yes, I am Jack Ron's son. He said, well, welcome to Omaha Beach. <laughs> but in any event, uh, he then, after I gave him the situation, how we had landed and what troops there were, how the enemy, what the enemy resistance was, he asked me to go to, where is your battalion commander? And I could actually point him out. He was not more than 75 yards away. And I said, I'll take you. And he said, you will not. You will stay with your men. They need you more than I do. But he didn't say that, but that was, this, that was what it meant. And so I stayed with the troops and he walked his way down. But as he was leaving, he turned to my troops and said, uh, you men are rangers. I know you won't let me down. He wasn't encouraging us to move out. He knew we would. So he expected things of us. And as he went that 75 yards over to Colonel Schneider, uh, he would stop with every group and he could see the, the gold or rather the orange diamonds on our helmets. He could see the ranger patches and he said, the same thing, 
but it finally morphed into, by the time he said it the last time, it was Rangers lead the way. And that's where we got our motto. And it was all Rangers got their motto from that Rangers lead the way, which the first time I heard it was, you men are Rangers, I know you won't let me down. But uh, he changed the whole complex of the Norman invasion. The orders that we already had were to proceed by platoon infiltration to the assembly points up on the land. And they were two, three, four miles away. But uh, what General Cota did was he said to Schneider, get your companies together and fight your way to the assembly points because you're going to operate as a battalion now. And that was the way it went. And what were your orders from there? Well, our orders were to get to the assembly area, and uh, which we never did, and uh, await further orders. When we got into Vierville itself, we, we tried to encircle Vierville on the south. Too many machine guns. Every field had three or four machine guns. So uh, we drew back, and this was the initiative of the B Company commander. He said, I'm not going to get through that way. My job is to get to Vierville, and the assembly area was on the other side. So he went straight down the coastal road, fought his way into Vierville, and at that point we got orders, you will not try attempt to receive, relieve the second rangers, you will protect the beachhead. So we redeployed the whole battalion around the boundaries of Vierville to make sure the beachhead beach held.